Greetings, YouTubers, friends, fellow teachers, a couple things. First of all, some of you might be using my Google Slides in the field. I have these decks that I've made available, and if you're out there teaching this curriculum in various circumstances, you might be interested to know that these slides have changed a little, especially the Beast deck. This is about, at the core of synergetics, there are these little tetrahedral partitions, particles. You're familiar with those if you watch this channel. This is not new content, but I've added a, a slide reconnecting Fuller's streamlined vocabulary over here on the right to the columns, the five columns, in a very useful table by Michael Goldberg in a 1970s article about space-filling tetrahedra. And he's summarizing what was known at the time of the writing, uh, his writing, and going on to explain some new discoveries. So there's a whole field about, you know, space-filling polyhedra, Archimedean dual honeycombs, uh, guy inch balls. Now those are multiple uh, polyhedra in play. In other words, kind of bricking up space. It's like tiling on a flat surface, but you're filling volume using voxels. You could say partitions, but you're you're interested in certain questions. Let's say, like what tetrahedra fill space? Right. We talk about that and how Aristotle. Uh, says tetrahedra fills space, and he gets some flack for that, but that his defenders say, well, he never said regular, and in that case, well, he's right, because the might. Aristotle was right, remember the might. Minimum tetrahedron, two A's and a B module, face bonded, and you get this non-handed, non-chiral space filler called the might, but it doesn't end there. You can glue mites together in a couple ways to get the bite and the right. And then the right itself, there are ways to carve it up. Different from just breaking it back apart into two mites. There's a half right and a quarter right. Right being one of Fuller's terms. So I'm weaving back and forth between like conventional mathematics. Goldberg, by the way, his name pops up in more than one context in in the fuller literature because he's also active in the divided spheres research right how to how to make a sphere out of multiple uh shapes right goldberg polyhedra we've talked about the waterman polyhedra the goldberg polyhedra it's like another series or a sequence of series more than one and this, this nomenclature started, the Goldberg nomenclature started to kind of come into the story for Fuller around the time they were discovering the G, sort of geodesic, let me say, icosahedral symmetry and then the nucleocapsid uh, capsomere counts in a virus, right? There's this nuclear shielding sometimes. There's different ways. That the viruses are not always the same design. There's so many different ways you can see um, or principles being employed in the virus, right? So in some, there's this nucleocapsid that's very much an icosahedral shielding for the RNA or DNA that's inside. And you can discover how many capsomeres are in this nucleo capsid using a formula that Fuller came up with. And when this discovery and this link was made between his research and virology, he tried to make the most of it, tried to get it uh, better publicized, because he was trying to bring attention to synergetics, obviously. Obviously. And it didn't pan out the way he'd hoped, because when Scientific American came out later, and sort of gave the history of these discoveries. Fuller was nowhere mentioned, right? They cut him out, you could say, even though he had self-promoted vigorously. And Michael Goldberg, 
because his formula for the uh, nucleocapsid capsomer counts took in more cases, what we call today class 1, class 2, class 3 of geodesic spheres, right? His formula in some ways was more general, although Fuller too was coming from a more general case because he wasn't always talking about um, the CCP or well, let's see, more like I should say he was talking about different shapes packing outwardly, like when do you, in the CCP, packing out really from a nucleus, where do you hit a cube conformation? Where do you hit, you know, a cube octahedron? Anyway, he's doing complementary research, Fuller is. And he's doing it in regard to the sphere packing and also with regard to tetrahedra that fills space. And in both these contexts, he crosses paths with Michael Goldberg. So I tell some of this story. I talk about asking Ed Applewhite, what about this Goldberg character? Like, and Applewhite's like, he had, it didn't have a mean bone in his body, this guy. He'd met him, Applewhite. Why he thought, you know, it could be, you could have this theory that, you know, how come, how come Goldberg pops up conveniently every time Floor is about to, like, score a discovery or somehow is in position to gain more uh, fame and glory for his synergetics. And then there's always this Goldberg guy who seems like to take the trophy at the end of the day. Well, because they're in the same interest, they have interests in a similar area. It's like Fuller did, you could say, quote unquote, compete with other mathematicians, other architects. And rarely was he the best at any one of those things, right? Because he flits about. He's a comprehensivist. So that's what I'm saying in this post to Trim Tab. I'm saying the price that Fuller paid for being sort of um, comprehensivist, polymathic, is that there's always somebody more specialized in each of the fields that he worked in who could be given really the more, more of the credit and there, there are always ways to tell the story that Fuller could be sort of left on the cutting room floor, his contributions. And I make a big deal out of that. I say this is a conscious plot in a way. Like, I turn it into a conspiracy. I admit it. I make it seem like there are people out to get Fuller in the sense of make sure his side of the story doesn't get the attention I think it deserves, right? It's partly, you could say, a fantasy. Like, really, who wakes up in the morning trying to diss Bucky? Very few people would have that on their mind. But when it comes to writing history, when it comes to writing articles, when it comes to looking back, I find various articles, say, in Wired Magazine and so on, that go out of their way to not give you much of this mathematical content. Ergo, punchline, there is kind of a note of rebellion of counterculture still associated with the fuller math or geometry. And it's pretty clear that lining that with the solar punk meme is a smart thing to do, given for example, the movie and book House of Tomorrow, which is already about a coming of age story wherein, you know, the principal is learning to be the next Bucky. That's the premise of the House of Tomorrow. The grandmother is like a super fan, we'd say a disciple of the Bucky stuff, and she wants her ward, her her uh, her grandson to be the next Bucky in a way. And in a way he rebels and he discovers, this is set in like the 80s, he discovers like punk music. He kind of busts away from, breaks out of being controlled by a grandmother figure, right? It's time for him as a teenager to find his own way. There is, however, an implicit message that actually, it goes full circle because Fuller in a way is himself rebellious and kind of punk in that sense, in that Synergetics has a countercultural flavor. But the movie doesn't really get into it. And I haven't read the book, but I don't think it does either in terms of 
what exactly are we talking about counterculture math? Where where does that go? What is that? And that's where we come in with all this BEAST and the concept of dimension and 4D and all the stuff that Fuller is into, right? That's the counterculture math. It's still there. It's still intact. It's ready for your interpretation. It's ready to be shared with the public more. Slide decks are there if you want to use them. My YouTube channel is full of the ideas, pedagogical, andragogical, and so on. So I'd say we've got the stash built up. It's just a matter of connecting the dots and saying, hey, do we want a better future, a la, say, the solar punk vis-a-vis vis -vis the cyberpunk um, aesthetic? Like, can we have a less dystopian future, please? And how can we fuel that sort of countercultural? How can we go against the dominant narrative in a sort of solar punky way? Well, we can teach more synergetics. It's kind of simple. Which lends itself to animation, computer graphics, and so forth. So we can move into the space more concertedly with greater fluency once this knowledge is laid down and done so kind of without the approval and consent or the blessings of the quote-unquote establishment, which has not done much, has re really, not, really not lifted a finger to promote this material in 40, 50 years, right? Like we're talking about something published in the late 1970s, and here we are, 2024. So I think it's legit to portray this material as verboten math, as I've talked about it, or Martian math in the sense of somewhat alien. And then you can take that in different directions, right? Mars attacks, right? We're not just going to sit back and watch our future be squandered by people ignorant of Fuller's contribution. Right? We want that positive future that was sort of dreamed up in the past to not fade away thanks to the ignorance of the present. Right? We're not going to give up that easily. Right? That's kind of the, the rebellious streak going here. All right? So those are your opportunities as teachers. Be on the front lines. Fight for a better future. And I'll talk to you in the near future.